Hello out there. Uh, this is Grant Scott on Hornby Island. I want to welcome you all to Herring Fest 2021. It's very different this year than what we usually do on the hall, uh, in the hall on Hornby Island, but we're very glad to do it this way. We want to start by recognizing that we're in the uh, traditional territory of the Coast Salish people and tradition, and uh, especially the Comox First Nation. Uh, we want to thank everyone who's helped make this work. There's an amazing number of people that um, contributed. Uh, there's the Board of Conservancy Hornby Island, the Arts Council, uh, the videographers. It takes a lot of people to put something like this on. I want to thank them all. Uh, we want to uh, also say that um, Conservancy Hornby Island does more than just the herring issues all year long. Um, we've got beach cleanups and all kinds of other things that people get behind. We work with Denman Island and a number of other Gulf Islands, especially something new. We're doing a climate change initiative that's called the Trees for Tomorrow project that uh, Rebecca uh, coordinates. We planted 10,000 trees last spring through COVID, which was quite amazing how that was done on Galliano Island and on Hornby Island. And we're working with a number, no, number of other islands and we definitely want to put a lot of life into that for obvious reasons, especially when COVID's finished. We have the art show that's going on. The exhibits are up uh, on web until March the 31st. Um, and we want to thank all the artists uh, who have contributed their work and especially the Hornby Island Arts Council and Rochelle Chinnery who put a lot of effort into making this whole thing work. So you can go to the Hornby Island um, Art Council's website uh, to get on there to find where the where all the, this um, the artwork is that you can take a look at and you can buy it if you want to. So thanks very much to all those folks. We also want to thank the uh, Pacific Salmon Foundation, who uh, contributed, made a very kind donation to make this whole thing work. We'd also want to thank all the people out there, the people that are on here now, and others who have donated to make this whole thing work. It's, um, you might think virtually it doesn't, somehow it costs a bunch of money. I haven't quite figured out how, but if you can help us with, with any more donations, we really appreciate that. So you can do that through Conservancy Hornby Island. Um, we said that uh, one of the main events for Herring Fest in the other years has been the boat trip. And um, this year, we're not, we're not gonna be able to do it because, um, we are going to do it, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. We've got the Casey and Finnegan boat trip, which you can get on uh, Conservancy Hornby Island's website. The two puppets, they're, they're out there on the boat on the old Sun Corona, and uh, they talk to the captain, and uh, it's quite an interesting thing. We also have uh, Bob Turner's amazing uh, video. Uh, it's called Herring Fishery 2020. And Bob captured a lot of the, the, what we would see if, uh, in our virtual boat trip. So uh, while we're not going to do it exactly the way we wanted to, there's those two things are there now. And what we're going to do uh, when the herring fishery actually starts, probably in two or three days, we're going to be going out every day and filming what's going on out there. And we'll be sending you links. The people that are on here will be sending you links to catch up on what's actually happening as the herring fishery unfolds, the boats come, all the birds and the wildlife. So I think it's a very exciting way of doing it. And uh, I want to apologize for not doing it exactly the way we advertise, but I hope you're okay with that. Um, after tonight's presentations, uh, if you stay on, there's uh, some feature films, short films. There's uh, Harry, the Herring, followed by, as I mentioned, Bob Turner's uh, amazing uh, uh, video. It's called the Herring Fishery of 2020 that, that he did around Hornby Island. And then there's Casey and Finnegan's first boat trip. So uh, you can stay in tune after, after the, the speakers and the panel that's going to be on afterwards. We're very fortunate to have some, uh, some incredible speakers tonight. We've got Chief Eric Pelkey. We have Dr. Dana Lepofsky. We have um, Brian, Dr. Brian E. Penn. And we have uh, David Suzuki, who's going to make a, a presentation. And then after them, after those folks are finished their presentations, we're going to have a panel that will have uh, Dana, Bryony, and, and Chief Eric 
will be on to answer your questions. So send your questions in. You look, look on the bottom there and it says Q&A on the bottom of your screen. You can send your, your uh, questions in and they will be, uh, we've got somebody who's gonna organize them and get them back to us and, and we'll, we'll ask the speakers and they'll respond to you. So we wanna say tomorrow is another event at the Harry School that starts at 10. We have some more speakers. We've got our uh, uh, member of parliament here uh, and, the ND, and the NDP fisheries critic in Ottawa, Gord John's gonna speak. He's been very instrumental in keeping this alive in the House of Commons in Ottawa. We wanna thank him. And we have some excellent speakers tomorrow. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome you all here again and, and now uh, carry on uh, with our guest speakers tonight. Thank you very much. We're very honored to have Chief Pelkey as our first speaker. He's a hereditary chief of the Sawat people and of the Wasanic nations down near Victoria, BC. So Chief Pelkey, thanks for being on Hearing Fest 2021 and welcome. Asa Kotskinem, Nist Seak Kosvinich. I am Eric Pelkey. I'm the hereditary chief of Seot, uh, part of the Kosvinich nation. I uh, have, um, I was bestowed uh, the hereditary chieftainship in the year 2000 after the death of my father. And uh, this was bestowed on me by the Grand Chief, Sammy, Sammy Sam, and uh, Simon Smith, the hereditary chief of Shotlip. But uh, I uh, am here today in regard to Halit Saslanet, save the herring, because herring Herring is a, one of the, the, the base foods of, of our people, a food that uh, carried them, carried them through the hard times. It was uh, the moon that we are in now on, on the Sandwich calendar is called the Wakas, Wakas moon. The Wakas moon. And uh, that is the Wakas is the frog. And it's because uh, the, the frog is the thing that uh, announces, announces the, the regrowth, the regrowth in our land, the coming out of the long sleep, which uh, the Mudjan nature does during the winter. And uh, and uh, the croaking of the of the frogs is what woke everything up. Woke everything up to start the regrowth process. So the, the we're now in the, the Wakas moon of the Hussainage calendar. And what else you know the the. The Wakas also, the Wakas moon, always told our people that the herring were coming. The herring were coming and they should prepare themselves. Prepare themselves. And uh, start uh, the, the preparations to go out and to harvest. Harvest the herring eggs as well as the herring themselves. And uh, when uh, the Indian Reserve Commission was coming around uh, our territory and protecting the reserves that we had, protecting the, the sites that we lived in, the sites that we harvested in, <clears throat> 1903, 
my great grandfather, Chief Louis Pelkey, went before the Indian Reserve Commission and asked them to please designate our Senate Reserve in Ganges Harbor, designated and protected because it was, it was one of the staples for our people for harvesting, harvesting herring. My great grandfather had a longhouse constructed in Ganges Harbor. And uh, where all of our family and relatives used to go and live there, live there during the, the harvest. So Wakas Moon, to wait to prepare for the, the harvesting of the herring. So our people uh, lived there and harvested all of the, the herring that was possible and all the herring eggs. The herring that they caught that they would hang them in the longhouse and smoke, smoke them. And those herrings would, would last last through, if they had enough, could last them right through the, the following winter and into the new year. But they also used them for trade because the, the, dried, the dried herring could be, could be uh, transported hundreds of miles in order to trade for things that we did not have in our territory. So that, that was a, a real trade item for us. And many people as far away as Yakima and down to Southern Oregon would always wait for the, the, our people to travel to their, their country in order to trade with the smoke, trade for the smoked herring. So that is, that is where we're at right now in our season, the Wakas Moon. So as, uh, now uh, in these days, we recognize that, that the herring have now become nearly extinct in our territory. Near, I say nearly because our, our people still see herring, young herring and adult herring within our territory, but they're very, very few. And what those herring are doing is they're fighting for life, fighting to hang on and trying to establish their, their families once again in our territory. So we see them, we see them and we, we pray we pray for those herring. And that's why we say, Halit Lestanet, let the herring live. We've seen in the past where the herring have, have grown and tried to reestablish themselves, only to have the commercial fish boats, the saners, and super saners come swooping in and harvest all of the herring and leave nothing for the regrowth of the herring. And the herring, you know, it, it feeds not only our people, but it feeds everything in the ocean. All of the salmon that join, that, that live in our territory and travel through our territory, all live on herring and follow the herring and live upon the herring in order for themselves to survive. So you know, uh, we even see the decline of, of uh, ducks in our waters in the Salish Sea because of lack of herring. Now, the We've noticed that for more than 30 years, how the duck was declining. 
the ducks were declining in our territory. Now we understand why. It's because the herring were dying. Now the ducks are dying. You know, and uh, it goes right up the food chain, right up to Kothalamich and the killer whales that live on the, on, the, on the salmon, on the Chinook. And the Chinook cannot survive without their food, without the herring that they, they thrive upon. And even the larger, larger whales all look for the herring for their survival. So all of the, the, the life in the Salish Sea is all connected together and needs to survive. You know, the, the, the Hussainish people are referred to by all of our, our neighbors, our neighbor First Nations, as the, as the saltwater people. The saltwater people is because everything that, that we live upon is, is come from the sea, because the Hussainish nation does not have a major river running through our territory in order to access the, the foods that we need. So we have to depend on the sea for that. And as a result of the lack of, of, uh, of seafood in our diet now, the health of our people have been suffering, suffering in many, many ways because of the lack of seafood. And I have experienced this personally with the loss of my sister. My sister uh, was hospital, hospitalized repeatedly, repeatedly for failing failing uh, liver and failing kidneys. And they couldn't find the, the couldn't, couldn't find the cause, couldn't find the cause. But sadly, you know, right towards the end, a specialist came in from Vancouver to see her at the Royal Jubilee Hospital and did a lot of tests. And he identified the problem that her, her liver was, was the, the main culprit that was failing because of the lack of seafood in her diet. The specialist came in and explained to us that uh, it is a well-known fact amongst the medical community on the coast of uh, British Columbia that many, many of our First Nations women are suffering or dying from this, the same malady of the lack of, of, of seafood in their diet and as a result, uh, um, having, having uh, liver disease. You know that uh, it is a really sad thing for me to experience, but to realize that this is a well-known fact amongst the medical community, I, I asked him, well, why, why don't we all know this? Why isn't that presented to the, the broader First Nations public? to identify this problem. And he said, well, that's not my job. That's not my job, you know. That's my, my job to publicize these things. You know, and but that, that really, really hurt me to find out that a lot of, a lot of our First Nations women are suffering and dying from this malady because of lack of seafood in their diet. This time of the year, this time of the year that we're in, 
is typically the long haul season of our people where we gather and uh, we sing sing our winter songs and gather and uh, do memorials for our 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 relatives and do pass down hereditary names and hereditary chieftainships in what uh, is generally known as potlatches. But we we call it Siowan. Siowan. And it's a it's a healing place for us. It's a healing, those are healing ceremonies for our people to carry on our life and carry on what we believe in. But we're not able to provide the food that traditionally went on the table because we can't find the herring anymore, which was, was this time of the year that this started to, to show up for the, the tables of our gatherings and how people looked forward to that, looked forward to having the herring and having the herring eggs on the table. Now when our people gather and they come together and they look around, they say, where, where is the herring? Why do we not have that for, for our people any longer? So it's now, it's definitely missing again from our diet. And, and also as a result, bringing down the general health of our people. And they ask us, they ask our leadership, why, why is our herring not here anymore? And we have to look, look around and see what's happening. And we see the commercial industry is raping the seas, raping the seas of our people with their huge seniors to go in and harvest an entire community of herring. Because all these people think that herring just pass through, pass through our area, but they don't. The herring come here, they're resident herring. They come here to live with their families and they return home to spawn every year. And that's what you see on the spawn season. The herring have come home to spawn. They spawn in bays and inlets and cover an entire area of their spawn because that's their home. And when the seniors move in and they scoop up the entire community of herring that have come in to spawn, they, they make that family extinct because they take everything and they leave nothing. And what we are left with is a few little escapees that managed to, to escape the nets of, of those super saners. And we, under, we, uh, we wonder why this is happening. How could this happen? Where you completely eradicate a whole family eradicate a whole species area of herring. This is not according to the beliefs of our people. You never, never, ever take everything. You're supposed to only take what you need. And you're supposed to guarantee that uh, that herring is going to live or that salmon is going to live on to feed the people of the future, not to eradicate it, not to clean it out. And that's what we're against. We need to address this, not only as, as First Nation people, but of people, the community, of British Columbia, even of Washington, Washington State in Alaska, to stop the overfishing, stop the 
stop the eradication of the of the herring and the eradication that follows of the salmon and the killer whales because it's all connected this, the entire ocean is connected when you kill off one small species the next one is going to fall and then the next and the next and we're going to wonder where we're going to get our food in the future when everything is gone because of this overfishing the Sanish Leadership Council came forward and asked for a moratorium on the commercial fishery within the Salish Sea. They, they brought that letter and they sent that letter to the minister. Sent that letter to the minister asking for that. To, to this day, I haven't seen a response to that letter was signed by all the chiefs of the Sinich nation. But we still think that's relevant. We still think that the minister must address that. But it's sorry to say that we feel that the, the commercial industry controls the voice of the minister. So we are Still saying we will, we will fight this. We will fight and halit lastanit. Save the herring. Because to save the herring, we're saving ourselves. Thanks very much, Chief Pelkey, for your very inspiring talk. I'd just like to suggest if you want to learn more about the Wasanic people, get the, um, get the book called Saltwater People by David Little. Little. David Little is a Wasanic person, and he's a hereditary relative of Chief Pelkey. So now we'd like to hear from Dr. Bryony Penn. She's a naturalist, a writer, an educator, and a well-known British Columbian. She's a broadcaster, been known in BC for her indomitable spirit and tireless devotion to protecting envir the environment and the, the wealth around this area. Bryony, thanks for attending Herring Fest. And again, if you want to use the Q&A feature on webinar, we'll be there to answer your questions. Thank you. Bryony, welcome. My name is Bryony Penn. I'm a, a long-term settler, resident of Fulford Harbor, Kwananich. Eric might be able to improve my pronunciation of this uh, of, of this place. So this first slide um, was taken by my great grandmother, who was an um, artist and uh, a settler of of what she called Salt Spring Island, uh, overlooking what she called Fulford Harbor. And so I grew up with stories from my great great granny and my great granny and my granny and my 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 own family about this extraordinary um, bounty of Fulford Harbor. And uh, right next door. Um, were, was the Seout Reserve and living next door was um, my great granny used to call him Charlie, but this is his uh, Sinchothan and I believe Hakaminum wife. You might know, Eric would be able to correct me. So my my understanding of the of Fulford Harbor was really informed by um, my own ancestors experiences of it and the stories of from their neighbors um i believe charlie was a fisherman and the harbor was always full of life uh, my mom used to talk about the herring spawns coming in the the blackfish that would follow the chinookian and 
the um, and the stories related to from there just exchanged as as people occupied this land. I mean, it it is it's a very rich harbor, and here's three generations of my family. Um, oh, they were in the boats all the time. They were fishing. They were clamming. They were sharing, you know, cultivating apples, but largely um, living well uh, with, with this tremendous bounty. And it's only, you know, through my relationships over time with people like Celia, uh, Belinda Claxton, and and Eric Pelkey that I've really come to understand actually what happened over the last hundred years and through colonization and so the the role of herring and my role of as a settler and the colonial exploitation of herring has become really a of a, a thing of of you know, interest to me, and also out of respect to elders like Celia and and Eric. So Celia also suffers from one of these the the this this lack of seafood in her diet, and has struggled with it. And um, so I've really felt that we all have a huge obligation to examine what we've been doing to this extraordinary resource. And my own understanding of, of the kind of bounty that used to be from my own family, I know that when I hear Department of Fisheries and Oceans telling me that, oh, herring are at historic levels, um, it, it's, it's, an, it's such an insult. It's an insult to anybody that, that knew this coast before the, the really the onslaught of some of these um, huge industrial fisheries that were unleashed on this coast. What they used to call the herring bonanza. So um, this is this is a, a wheel that I worked on with Celilia and many of the elders, later Earl Claxton. And this is referring again to Eric referred to when he talks about Wakas, these are the 13 moons. And you see on the Wekis, sort of where the Douglas fir and the, there's a, I can see W-X-E-S, Wekis, Moon of the Frog. Um, this was a collaboration um, that was um, asked for by Celia because she felt that this would help to aid the understanding if we work together, Senanito, to work together. And, and it was in the doing of this and listening to elders and understanding this incredible interconnectedness of everything, not just not just the herring and the salmon and the orcas, uh, but everything, all the plants. The, and so these kinds of, of um, stories have really informed um, my understanding, certainly, of the herring and the, 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 the incredible um, problems with the way DFO has characterized the fishery. So I just want to take people back to 1859, which is around the time that my family um, arrived here, and many of my family were um, part of these uh, corporations that were just intent on exploitation. So I'm just going to read this in case people can't read it. Herring fishery. Why? Why it is someone is not already engaged in putting up herring in and around Victoria for home use and exportation, we know not. Of one thing we are certain, that the herring fishery would this season find profitable employment for hundreds of our population. Our shores are swarming with them. And as I look out my window today, I still live on Fulford Harbour, the shores are not swarming with them. The shores should have been swarming with them but they are not swarming with them anymore. 
So this is 1905. By 1905, the corporations are starting to form the Nanaimo herring canning. This was just one of the advertisements um, about the way that these companies formed and allocated shares and set a pattern that was to continue um, and continues to this day. Um, here you're seeing this, this um, borrowed tradition coming out of the Scottish herring uh, industry, which they used to call them silver darlings, which they which completely collapsed. And so a lot of my relatives were Scottish. They had exhausted the Scottish herring populations, and now we're arriving on the on the Pacific, and we're set to exploit them as well. Um, this is from the Colonist again in 1906. Um, it says, by combination of circumstances now existing in British Columbia, our proposition shows money-making possibilities that are astounding. First, because it's by far the most profitable indigenous industry to British Columbia. Second, because it is the first and only herring cannery along the Pacific coast. And third, because the business is a permanent one and the product is consumed by every man, woman, and child in the country and will in addition be exported largely to the Orient and elsewhere. And fourth, because the herring can be purchased by the company in unlimited quantities at prices ranging from $3.50 to $8 per ton. Again, in the 1906 Colonist, um, there's an editorial and it says, the best thing for gover governments to do in relation to the herring fisheries is to let them alone, except in so far as the police of the sea is concerned. Would this proviso let the people fish how they like, as they like, and when they like? At present, I must repeat the conviction we expressed so many years ago that there is not a particle of evidence that anything man does has an appreciable influence on the stock of herring. It will be time to meddle when any satisfactory evidence that mischief is being done is produced. And I'd like to suggest that a hundred years later there is sufficient and satisfactory evidence that mischief has been done. So I want to just show you this clip. This was produced in 1953, I believe. And I want people to listen really carefully to when they are fishing, the size of the herring, and to the structure of the industry at the time. It's produced by the National Film Board. In the waters along Canada's Pacific coast, in the Gulf of Georgia, in the channels between Vancouver Island and the mainland, the fleets of the fishing companies compete for a share of the catch. It's early autumn and time for herring. This is big business, expensive business. A saner may cost $120,000. A herring net alone will cost $28,000. There's big money, too, for the fishermen. But to make it, they've got to get their catch before the quotas fished up and the area closed. If a company's fleet is lagging behind, it means big worries. Well, I'm plenty worried. Fleet's off to a bad start, and it'll soon be too late to catch up. I'll call you back. Not much change. Bye. Crusader got another 300. Have you heard how the other companies are doing? Jimmy says they're picking it up pretty fast. Well, our boys are better get cracking. They'll be closing that area any day now. Yeah! Bring 
that I did around um, 1994, the, the herring in Fulford Harbor um, had disappeared by around 1983. We just suddenly stopped. They just were nowhere. And I went around and I interviewed some of the old timers and produced this map to try and capture what Fulford Harbor um, was like at the time from, from some of the um, settler uh, old timers. And of course, the same, this, this sort of, this story started to, I started to hear the same story over and over and over again about the fact that the herring had been there up until, so it, it would sort of had resurged after some of the, the big commercial fisheries earlier. And then suddenly in the 80s, um, the fish, the uh, population just disappeared again. So um, we put together, this was a, a collaborative effort of Vanessa McMartin, of Alex Harris, a young filmmaker, and, and myself. And we, we looked at DFO data, and then that was dating back to the 50s, and then charted when there was no more spawn after a period like there'll be three years of no consecutive spawn so each one of those you can see were spawns herring spawns these are the sort of bay pop populations as it were and i'm just gonna just watch those blue oops that's sorry um not sure how to okay there it goes you can just start seeing the blue dots will just start disappearing and this is dfo's own data and what these coincide with, and we've we've got the evidence, and and people like Dana Lepofsky and her lab have got the evidence of people uh, stating that the saners would come into their bays and then clean them out. Um, so there it is again. So um, let's just let's just look at what happened in in Fulford Harbor itself. This was. Swanson Channel is um, the regional name, but this is Salt Spring Island. And the Ganges um, population is, is at the top with all those colors and the Fulford, Fulford spawning population is below. And these were spawns that traditionally occurred. And so what you were watching was in the in the animation before was the disappearance of essentially these spawns. So um, even though they might occur slightly different places along the shoreline and different eelgrass areas, and you know, herring are ultimately very very adaptable and and very good at at ducking and weaving predators. But um, saners are they have not figured out how to duck those saners that we saw in that clip. So here's, um, here's DFO's data for um, Swanson Channel. And you can see that's exactly the year, 83. I remember looking at this and going, yep, that's exactly right. Uh, 1983 is when, so you saw 1950, they, they were just recovering from being really hit back by those fisheries that you saw in the, in the movie. And they started to rebound, just like Eric says. They, these families come back. They're amazingly resilient. And they were starting to, they got hit back again. You can see the big fisheries. Um, the catch is blue and the red is the estimated spawners. Um, they're, doing, they're doing very well. They've, they're, they're building up their stocks again. And then 1983. And then you get these few little stragglers trying to, to, to do their best. And now we haven't had spawn in our in Fulford for years um, that has really even been visible. So um, this is another um, uh, account by Walter Paul of Klamin. And this was another important bay population. 
the Department that. of Fisheries and Oceans decided that uh, uh, they were going to open up a terminal fishery, a commercial fishery here in front of the village, and in Mellispina Strait from Grief Point all the way up to uh, Dinner Rock. So it was all saners basically that came in, and uh, they would blow the horn, and away they'd go and uh, and go on with the bonanza and collect all the uh, their hay they could, right? So they they did that three years in a row, and it was after that, probably not the next year, but you know the year after, two years later, that you could see a decline happening with the uh, return of the herring. So the questions were posed, you know, at that point uh, that to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, you know, we wanted an answer as to why, you know, they thought that the uh, herring was in decline. And, um, you know, they kind of put us aside and pushed us back and, you know, and uh, didn't really have an answer for us right away. So, you know, we took it for granted that it was the uh, same fishery that, you know, decimated the, the stock, you know, and... Uh, so eventually they came back to us with their answer is that, you know, the herring that did come here into Mellispina Street in front of the village, Scuttle Bay, was not a, um, was a basically a transient herring that came here and milled around here. And before they're, as they're ready to spawn, they would leave and head for Vancouver Island, Denman Island, Hornby Island, that area to spawn there. And uh, I thought that it was a week you know, a weak excuse, you know, uh, to us for that, as we we understood and we seen at first hand the spawn that happened here. You know, they would spawn here, and they would stay here. So, um, there was a real sea change within DFO itself. Um, in 1986, sort of around that those years, uh, one of their or two of their scientists, Jake Schweigert, um, produced a document that was really looking at what it did a whole questionnaire with, with fishers and First Nations fishers um, about where, where were these non-migratory stocks? And that was the language that was used by DFO. That's certainly the language that we all use. We used to call them resident herrings. They were the herring that kind of moved for, for my family, they would move out into um, Sansom Narrows and that's where you'd see all the ducks, you'd see the grebes, you'd just see everything out there. There'd be like a winter population of birds and they would um, hang out there with these resident stocks. Um, so in 86, those, the, this questionnaire was done and a, um, a report was done and Marion Lightly, this article here on homesteader herring did a article for one of the fishing magazines and it was kind of like raising the question that it wasn't it was a problem that all these local bay populations or resident populations non-migratory there was a lot of different language lots of different fishermen different terms but it was really well understood that we had herring all year and they would go to certain areas and that um, they would then come back into other specific areas to spawn and sometimes they would um, I remember um, Eric uh, his, his cousin or his relative Dave um, Elliot and the uh, talks about the scouts leading them in you know into their bays to come and spawn so there was a lot of understanding not fully but that the fact that DFO really needed to get their 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 heads around this fishery because it was really pushing down these these resident stocks and they were um, and that was impacting them so here's here is Jake Schweigert's uh, uh, document, the Georgia and Johnson Straits Herring Bait Fishery in 1986, results of a questionnaire survey. And it points to these really important, what we would have called winter bait fishery locations, Sansom Narrows, Cowichan Bay, Swanson Channel, Bedwell Harbor, that's where people went to get, and you would ask any fisherman and they'd say, yeah, that's where I go to get my bait. Um, and so for people, for the DFO to start saying that suddenly that no, there's no such thing as resident or overwintering or it, it would just it it was a nonsense. Um, 
It didn't make any sense. And here's another page in the in the DFO book, um, which clearly identifies non-migratory spawning locations and migratory spawning locations. And in this document, there's over 230 non-migratory locations described by local fishermen. So you can see right there, Fulford Harbor was a non-migratory spawning location. So um, fast forward from 1990 on, there seems to have been complete amnesia in the fisheries and oceans uh, department about ever having produced these documents, that there ever was identified a problem by any of the nations. It doesn't matter which local nation you walk into, they'll have the same story. Um, you can go and find elders who will say, oh yeah, 1984, the saners came in at night, they fished all night, and we never had a herring spawn again. Um, so at that stage, by, by the late 90s, we were, I believe the first um, protest that we did was in 95, and it was in Shimanus, and it was citizens from the islands who were missing their herring, and it was First Nations, Shimanus people. Um, saying, stop fishing our herring. And I remember walking around with my sign saying, save the herring. And um, people kind of looked at us incredulously. I had a herring and a Chinook and an orca on my sign. And it, you know, the level of understanding of, of say, the settler population was very low. So it was a, it was a long um, process of, of trying to educate um, the local communities. And, um, and, and that continued over the next, uh, 95, 2005, <laughs> 25 years, 25 years, um, different members of local communities have been writing letters, um, trying to argue that the fisheries needs to be better understood. It's not okay to treat it as one big meta population, one big migratory population that just swims in and goes to one place and that's what you manage. And it's not okay to say that historic levels were based in 1951. If you remember that diagram I showed you in 1951, they were at historic lows. So that's not a historic baseline. I prefer to go to the historic baseline of the time of the uh, British colonist newspaper in Victoria that said our shores we're swarming with herring. Um, so the, the real issue, I feel, has been that we have been dealing with a corporate fishery and a government that is in closely aligned with a corporate fishery. And as in all things, fisheries have really worked on the on the the, uh, the principle of economies of scale and amalgamation. And we have had a f the, 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 Harry, the herring, which was a, a logo that was developed for school kids, um, has had a formidable ally and it, it's in the form of Jimmy Patterson Enterprises. Um, this is a man that has the second largest privately held company. He has companies in fisheries, coal ports, logging, food, all things that actually herring um, are, uh, you know, could actually be um, a threat to. Um, because when you start looking at the impacts of logging on estuaries and their and their and their their, their breeding habitat, and you start looking at the impacts of port development on the Fraser River, and you look at the impacts of uh, the commercial fisheries, the kill fisheries. Um, you realize that this is not a company and this is not a man that is that interested in the stories of elders all throughout the Salish Sea. And I just noted that, uh, that he was cited as saying his best year yet was 2020 with annual sales of $10.9 billion. Um, so Rob Morley, he's always, uh, Patterson has always kept ex-DFO people very close to him and political people close to him. And Rob Morley, who was an ex-DFO economist, is his representative presented in Parliament in, in 2016, arguing that he didn't hold a, 
a monopoly that he only held one third of the herring seine licenses and 12 percent of the gillnet licenses um, but it really depends on how you track those companies these are all companies which are somehow affiliated with Jimmy Pattison Enterprise or the Canadian fish company Can Fisco. They're either operators when uh, Jimmy's boats are the uh, Jimmy is the owner, or they're operated in some way. They're they're working and liaison. So it it looks when you go and look at the data, it looks um, sizably more than thirty percent of these uh, fisheries are owned by one man. So I just wanted to finish with a couple of last sort of this again I'm going to read it but I think it's worth reading. This was um, an article that was put out by two ex-DFO fishers, fish, uh, fish scientists rather, Carl Waters and Richard Hedrick, um, that were that provided evidence of the suppression of and the political interference with research by industry-influenced government officials. And this was published in the Canadian Journal of Fish and Aquatic Science in 1997. It said, the present framework for linking science with management can and has led to abuses that threaten the ability of scientists to understand fully the causes of fish declines, to identify means of preventing fishery collapses from recurring, to incorporate scientific advice and management decisions, and to communicate research in a timely fashion to as wide an audience as possible. The existing framework of government-sponsored fisheries science needs to be replaced. It has failed to ensure viable fish resources and thereby sustain the fishing people and fishing communities upon which successful fisheries management depends. The economic and societal cost of this failure to Canada has been enormous. So I want to finish with um, the collaboration. Um, the, the, there's over 167,000 people that have signed petitions. There are uh, our MPs. I think Gord John's going to be speaking. There has been the Association of, of BC Municipalities. And so when Wasanich Leadership Council, um, we, 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 worked together, Sananito, you can see on the left the word Sananito, um, which is that the, uh, the, the settler communities um, banded together with the um, First Nations communities to support a First Nations vision of what it could be, which is that we need to we need to have indigenous research, not Western science based on climate models that that are sorry that uh, fisheries models that really are inadequate, and that we should be going back to family managed herring sites, and that we should have a moratorium on this fishery, and that we should um, uh, support a herring restoration program, and this was the culmination of that conference and forum that we held. Thanks. Thanks to Brian and Chief Pelfi for very inspiring presentations. I'd like to now emphasize that fundraising is a key part of Conservancy Hornby Island Herring Fest events. Not one of the most pleasant things we want to do, but we want to remind you that it takes uh, fundraising to make these events happen. So if you feel comfortable doing that, go to Conservancy Hornby Island website and hit the donate button. And we're now, um, well, we just want to reemphasize that the art show is a key part of, of uh, this whole event. And the, the artists that have put these pieces together are donating uh, as much as 50% uh, or more of the profits from the, from the sale of their art to the Conservancy. I'd like to go on to our next series of speakers. It's unfortunate, but Chief Vakoma of the Qualicum Nation can't be with us tonight. But we're very fortunate to have Dr. Dana Leposki. Dr. Uh, Leposki is an archaeologist and an ethnoecologist who has worked collaboratively with Indigenous peoples on the Northwest Coast for the last three decades to blend traditional knowledge with Western science. She's a professor at Simon Fraser University and lives on 
neighboring Laskiti Island. Welcome, Dana, and thanks for attending Hearing Fest 2021. Thank you. I want to thank all the organizers of this wonderful event. I wish I could see everybody in person, but in lieu of that, this is really a spectacular feat that you guys have pulled off, and I'm very grateful. I'm also really grateful to have a chance to talk about herring, um, a little critter for which I'm very passionate. And I want to acknowledge in, in doing this that everything that I'm going to be sharing with you, really, I've learned from knowledge holders across Indigenous communities up and down the coast, from Alaska to Oregon, and also from non-Indigenous people who also care passionately about herring. And so I have the privilege of sharing this knowledge with you, but really, you're hearing many voices today. So today, what I want to talk to you about specifically is the cultural importance of herring. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of knowledge and data that you can bring to understanding the cultural importance. And I want to kind of cover those, some of those today and talk about what we can learn from those different kinds of knowledges, but also to kind of reflect on what that different kinds of knowledge is about the cultural importance of herring can tell us about how we should be honoring and protecting herring today and into the future. So when anthropologists and archeologists talk about herring as a really culturally significant species, we often use the term a cultural keystone species. And this is a term that reflects uber importance, importance of a species that, a species that is so important to a cultural group that if you took it away, if you removed it from people's lives, it would change the way people feel about themselves, about the world around them, about the people around them, everything. So these are species that have been used a lot and often for a long time that people still have connections to. It's reflected in language and narratives and in lots of different kinds of ways that you'll see. And this is just a smattering of photos of herring among indigenous peoples here on the coast, Bill Gladstone and Bella Bella, um, a photo here in Haida Gwaii, of um, herring row on kelp. Bill's holding a photo here of herring on a hemlock bough. And then here is Grace Adams and, and Marie Francis from Salam and First Nation, very close to here. Um, gathering row uh, on some of the kind of the little bits of row that still occasionally shows up in their territory. And as we'll see in the past and into the deep past in Tlaaman territory, herring was abundant consistently um, through time and very much a cultural keystone species. So what does it really mean to be a cultural keystone species? And I find that people, settler communities, non-Indigenous communities have a hard time with this concept. What do we mean that there's a species that's so important that if you take it away, it changes the way you interact with everything around you? So I asked my students, and, uh, one of my classes a couple of years ago, what was a cultural keystone species to them? And one student, a very fine student, raised his hand and said, I don't think I have a food or a species that is that important to me. Well, I'd miss being able to order pizza. So although we can think this is kind of funny or, you know, kind of naive, and in fact, it really brings home to me the, the guy, how difficult it is for people who are not land-based through time to understand what we mean by a cultural keystone species and why it matters. Compare that quote to this one by Elder Charlie Bob of Tulama Nation. He said, referring to the depletion of herring from overfishing, it was just like taking our home away. So if you juxtapose these two quotes and think about kind of why sometimes there's such a disconnect in discussions today about preservation, conservation, around the table with, um, with uh, fisheries managers, I think you'll see a lot here that kind of explains why we're kind of not coming to the same conclusions about what needs to be done. So how do we know that herring was a cultural coastal species for indigenous peoples in the Strait of Georgia? We have lots of different kinds of evidence. I'm gonna take you through some of them, historical records, place names, oral traditions, 
people's memories, their lived experience, and then the archaeological record. So what does this historical record tell us about, about herring as a keystone species? Well, there's lots of records that talk about its abundance and indigenous um, use of herring from the earliest uh, settler colonizers, explorers to come to this region. They talk about um, indigenous people harvesting herring up and down the coast. But I want to read you this one in particular. In the Straits of Georgia, the schools in certain months of the year, usually the fall, may extend for many miles. Indeed, in 1893, a small tug passed for three hours through a continuous mass of migrating herring in the month of June. While I myself, this is Carruthers in the 40s, have seen in February dead herring thickly covering the surface of the sea near Nanaimo for a distance of over two miles. So what I would argue is what this quote is saying that herring was more abundant in the past than we could even possibly get our, our, our minds around. When we think we have a, we talk about herring here and herring there and it being a really good year in this place or that place. What this quote tells me is that it was abundant and consistently abundant beyond our reckoning. A small tug passing for three hours in, in June. I think that that would really give a lot of people pause if you considered what that would be like. So the oral traditions tell us a similar story. You have from um, Dr. Elsie Paul's book um, from Tlama Nation 2014, she said, she tells us about the importance of oral traditions. These aren't just stories. These are legends or stories. It was the watching, the watching your elders, your grandparents, the adults in which they did what they did, how they lived, how they gathered, how they fished, how they hunted. You didn't learn that out of a book. So she's telling us that these oral traditions actually embody a history, a meaningful history. And it was how this knowledge was passed on. So we find in the, in the Talaman story about Raven Gives a Feast that was told by Rose Mitchell in 1981 to Randy Bouchard and Dorothy Kennedy, that Loon uses a basket to scoop herring for a feast from far out to sea. And when he returned, the basket was filled with herring, which he distributed to the people. This tradition tells you how important herring is and also that you could go out to sea and find them and dip net them. They were around, they were abundant, they were central to people's lives. We see it in traditional place names, like in Tishoshan, um, just north of Powell River and in Talam in traditional territory, meaning waters white with herring spawn. And I actually did archeological work there and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Or, and I can't pronounce this correctly, so I'm not gonna attempt to pronounce the the indigenous name for what we now think of as the ferry terminal in the North Vancouver, water sizzling with herring. So imagine that concept, sizzling with herring, and it was consistent enough and abundant enough that it got a place name that stuck through time. We know that herring was a cultural keystone species from a lot of lived experiences, from memories. And really, this is listening to people, paying attention to Indigenous people about their memory and knowledge about herring is central, I think, to um, the story of settler community recognizing the importance of herring. Indigenous people have been saying for decades, hey, something is not right here, pay attention. And in fact, that's me up in the upper left-hand corner talking to the then chief of Tulama Nation, Walter Paul. And he said to me, hey, Dana, if you're excavating at this site and you're finding hundreds of thousands of herring of bones, which we were, and our oral traditions say that herring were abundant here and we have photos, why is departments of fisheries and oceans telling us that herring weren't abundant here and that they came and go, that doesn't fit? And I looked up from my hole in the ground and I went, oh my gosh, Walter, yes, why? Why, why, why have I had my head in a hole? So we have here Les Adam, Mary George, who lived at, at Tishosham and could tell me about herring, Charlie Bob, Michelle Washington, one of my great leaders, and Dr. Elsie Paul. This is just a smattering of a number of people over the years, and especially in the Salishi, who have talked to me about the cultural importance of herring and the abundance of herring in the past. 
So we have Jerry Gallagos, for instance, telling me that herring were so abundant that they were constantly hit your fishing boots. Or Walter that said, yeah, the herrings, right now I think you got, they get them six to seven inches. And the herring we used to get back when we were probably 10 to 12 inches and a little bit bigger. So that's another sign of their plentifulness and how abundant they were. Phil George shared with me, they dry the herring on a rack and then you roast it on the fire. That's keksum, they call it. And there were a lot of herring racks. My grandfather had herring racks. My great grandfather had herring racks. My mom and dad, all the way down, down time you'd see in the back of the houses, they had herring racks, but not anymore. Talking to elders here in, in the 80s, this is the work of David Ellis and, and the community of Tulum. And again, they were able to record all the many places, if you can see my cursor, up and down Tulum territory, immediately close to the reserve, where herring are either spawning in purple, yellow coming together and massing, or herring spawning and massing in the, in, the, in the orange. So you can see there were lots of places on the coast where people talked about herring being plentiful. And it doesn't mean, of course, that it wasn't these other places, it's just not that where people went. The point is that there was a lot of places to get herring close to home, not so today. The thing about being a cultural keystone species is that it's, you, you means that you relate to that species in a particular way and that there were right ways to relate to that species. It means that you understand that if you don't behave correctly, you will lose that intimate relationship with that species and they might, that species who you might consider to be kin might choose not to come back. So Dr. Elsie Paul, again, in her book says, it's not so much prayers, but it's how you hand it, how you receive it. A lot of it's by the hands, the raised hands, like you would, be greet, like you would greet people, a visitor with us. It's more like how you treated the food and the teachings that come with that. You know what you are not to do. All these things had a life, and now it's going to give you a life. So you need to thank the creator to thank what's there in front of you. You might be just in your thoughts, or your gestures, or how you look at that. So again, a very particular and intimate relationship between people and herring. And it's reflected in the fact that herring, as you will see archeologically, were abundant throughout time, even though people harvested them extensively. So we know from memories and from archival documents that people harvested and processed both the herring fish itself and then the roe. This is a, a, a drawing up actually up in, up up north, but I put it in to show you the herring rake. And I don't know if you, if for those of you who are viewing at home, if you can see this, um, this tool right here, and you can see another one down below, it's a close up. And basically what it is is this long, long pole with what used to be either wood or bone points, and, and more recently in historic times were nails, at a certain distance apart, and then someone would stand in a crew canoe, and as Charlie Bob taught me, you would sweep through the herring that were massing and abundant, and then you would flick it off into your canoe. And you can see that, that this fellow is doing right here, and you can see that his boat is filled with herring. This is just another pair, picture here closer to home, of um, a Spanish voyage was 1792, and they record that this herring rake fishery is so easy that in an hour they would load up one of their canoes. So again, hard to imagine that kind of abundance today. <clears throat> and then the row, the herring row, which is so important to indigenous peoples up and down the coast. And in fact, I, I would say that for many indigenous people up and down the coast, they're more interested in the, the roe than the fish, not entirely, and it's very group dependent. But the roe was so important culturally because it, it came at a certain time of year and it was this important event where people gathered and shared and traded knowledge and ideas and stories. And it was a really important part of the social um, context that carried forward throughout the year and throughout generations. So this is, Mary George in 1981 at Clay Quantum. And Mary is actually removing here the herring row that has been placed on the bows that are placed at low tide 
um, and then the herring would come in and then deposit their row. And here you see a photo from 1938 at Clonum. That's all the herring on the boughs being dried, and then they're removed and then stored and eaten for that throughout the year. And another photo down below, also at Clay Quantum. And what's neat about this photo is you can see not only the, the row being dried, but you can also see up here on top of the rack, a bunch of all the fish, the herring themselves that have been drying at the time. So one thing we know from our interviews is that now when we see a um, herring come into spawn, it's for a day here and there. And thus we have this idea about how the fishery must have always been. But if you look at the interviews and if you look at the, the archival um, knowledge that I shared with you before, in fact, spawning and masking times were really long. And in fact, we have information, for instance, about spawning in December, you know, not in the spring. So it was just a much more vibrant and active system than it is today. The archeological record tells us quite a bit about herring. For one is that um, there's this herring, these, these, these fish traps that you see up and down the coast. And, and people used to think they were all for um, salmon. So for instance, this is one at Slam and Point in, the, in um, the reserve north of Powell River. And if you guys can see these beautiful stone um, boundaries here at the point. It's a beautiful, beautiful fish trap. This, um, I, I don't want to, I should have practiced, I don't want to butcher the Tlama name for it, but this is the Tlama name for this kind of trap. And basically what you can see is this is a stone barricade. And then in the past they would make a, a wood lattice that they would either, that would, be, that would be dropped down or risen up depending on what the tide is doing and it would capture the fish behind. So, we have these kinds of traps and we also have wooden traps like this one in Comox Harbor that um, was dated to about 1300 to 800 years ago. And only recently, a couple of years ago, they found some of this lattice work actually preserved in the mud. This is a reconstruction by the wonderful work of um, Nancy Green for a herring trap. And we find these kinds of features up and down the coast. And we know from the archeological record that yes, they're catching salmon, but a lot of them are for catching herring. And by catching herring, we also know that they formed like mini ecosystems and they attracted all kinds of other fish that relied on herring and other critters that relied on herring. So they created kind of these ecosystems that could be managed and you, people could decide when are we gonna collect from them and when aren't we? Who's gonna collect from them and who isn't going to? So a very, very important part of the archeological record and in reflecting the cultural importance of herring in the past. And then of course is the archeological fish bones. And this is, uh, gives you an idea what these herring fish bones look like. And you can imagine excavating a site like I have at Clay Quantum and other places where you get hundreds of thousands of these teeny bones. These bigger ones are salmon and the smaller ones are, um, are herring. This is actually, uh, a herring rake that was made for me by Elder Charlie Bob. And I just wanted to juxtapose it with the kind of points that we find, um, the bone points that we find archeologically, which may be for a rake or they may be some other composite fishing tools. It's hard to tell. And this is what the deposits look like archeologically. This is what these thousands of years of herring harvesting looks like to an archeologist. When my colleague Ian McKechnie and I and many other authors compiled all the um, fishbone evidence from archaeological sites in the Northwest Coast. We found that herring, not salmon, was actually the top species many of the most of the time when archaeologists used a small enough screen to catch herring bones. You can imagine that for a long time archaeologists were using big screening sizes and the herring bones would fall through. And they would say, oh, salmon is obviously the most important because the herring is, it was gone from the record. Well, look at this. If you, I'm just, up here in the, in the upper right-hand corner is the Salish Sea. And what these symbols mean, the diamonds and the, what is that? One, two, three, that's a hexagon. Show that of the, of the fish bones that we recorded, 60 to 100% of them are herring. Look at that. So that tells me that there was a lot of herring in the past, that it was consistently among the most abundant species of fish represented archeologically. 
We can break it down further on the coast. We can look at the Salish Sea. You can see if you can interpret this, it says that in some sites there's zero and then sometimes there's 100% of fish bones or herring. But if we look more closely at the Salish Sea itself, at the bottom graph, you can see that the variation comes really mostly because the Fraser Delta and Puget Sound have less herring. Some sites have lots, that's what it means up here in 80%, but some sites have none. But here in the eastern strait of Georgia, the east coast of Vancouver Island, and the Gulf Islands, southern Vancouver Island, herring is pretty much consistently on the top end of the graph from 60 to 100% with just a very few outliers. So what does all this mean? That herring is, is a cultural keystone species. What can we do with that information, knowing that it was abundant and, and so culturally important, and that the archaeological records said it was consistently important? It wasn't just here and there sporadically in the herring. Yes, they're migratory, but it didn't mean that people had to do without. What do we do with that? Well, I just want to leave you with a quote that um, was recorded in 1915 by the ethnographer Curtis about the Uikonos, a little bit north of the Salish Sea because it gives you an idea of kind of really what is a cultural keystone species again and what we should do with that, knowing that information. What's our responsibility to this herring? The Wicano and probably other tribes have preserved an ancient custom in the practice observed by the person who is in spring, finds the first dead herring or ooligan, another small fish on the beach. He holds it in his hand and addresses it, oh grandchild, you have come. Then he makes a smacking sound with his lips and still gazing at it continues, may you increase instead of decreasing. And so always, and so always, let it be so. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. That yeah, was yeah. true. I'm hoping everybody can hear me, but that was truly amazing. And we want to thank the speakers. I mean, it was just thinking back on on it, uh, Chief Pelkey there, the sadness of the impact of losing hearing on his people. The uh, uh, speaking about the the uh, the keystone species, the evidence, all that, and the sad thing that gets to me is the fact that DFO keeps talking about historic highs and ignoring all this evidence from First Nations people all, all, and these important scientists all through the year. So, so Kath, uh, are you going to be able to lead us? Oh, no, wait a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got so wrapped up in what those people were saying. I forgot what my job was here for a minute. So I want to now... Um, say that we have a special message from, from Dr. David Suzuki before we launch into the question and answer part of this. Dr. Suzuki is a well-known Canadian scientist. He, he's a television personality. He's the author and environmental activist. He's known for his ability to make scientific and environmental issues relatable and understandable to the public, especially through his series, The Nature of Things, and for his efforts in environmental conservation. So uh, could you play? The, the video of uh, Dr. Suzuki, please. I'm delighted that, uh, that you're having this herring festival. I really think, you know, one of the things that indigenous people have, have taught me is the importance of ceremony. Ceremony in our, our prayers, our songs, our dance, um, that reaffirm the things that really matter in our lives, especially our connection with Mother Earth. And it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't surprise me that we tend to, you know, have our ceremonies around important people, I guess, like kings and queens and, and people like that. But to celebrate the parts of, our, of where we are uh, this way is wonderful. I think we ought to have blueberry festivals and cedar festivals and all kinds of things that remind us of uh, the things around us that matter. Look, the the oceans are a mess you know the oceans are the are where everything ends up 
um, if you're a, a farmer, whatever you're using on your fields ends up in the oceans. And so we have more and bigger uh, dead zones, which, uh, um, you know, where nothing can live, they're getting more frequent, bigger and lasting longer. Of course, we've all heard that there is now more weight of plastic in the oceans than living fish. And of course, um, uh, we're uh, depleting the oceans by uh, uh, our effective ways of, of targeting uh, big fish like, like sharks. Um, our, our techniques and our demands on the oceans have begun, become too great. The problem I think we have on the West Coast is that uh, we are having our resources managed from Ottawa. They've screwed up the fishery on the East Coast and they certainly are doing the same thing on the West Coast. We did, a, the David Suzuki Foundation years ago did a study called Fisheries That Work. And around the world, there are examples of fisheries that have been sustained for dozens of years, if not centuries. And when you look at them, you find that invariably the responsibility and the accountability for caring for the resources is local. The local people with an interest are the ones who manage it. You can't manage it from Ottawa. But there's an even more profound uh, problem we have a political system in which we elect people to office by voting and they then become responsible for the people that vote, you know, and that's why there's so much concern before elections come to get at the voters and tell them all the wonderful things politicians have done. But those most profoundly affected by what politicians do or do not do, don't vote. Children don't vote. Future generations don't vote. The ocean doesn't vote. The atmosphere doesn't vote. Rivers, lakes, forests, they don't vote. And yet they are going to be profoundly impacted. I think that, you know, and the way that we try to manage, there's so much pressure on, uh, on Ottawa to manage according to the economic needs and the political needs of vested interest groups that um, they never manage on the basis of biology. They never manage on the basis of the bigger system. The oceans are a mess. Within that, uh, most of the fish are a mess. Um, most of the water is a mess. Uh, I've had long discussions with the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans over fish farms saying, look, it's not that I'm against fish farms, but for heaven's sakes, when the ocean is a mess, why do you continue to use it as a garbage can with open nets? Put them into closed containments if you're gonna have fish farms for heaven's sakes. But no, we can't do that because of the economy, the economics of it apparently uh, militate against that. And the other thing is that what, what we find is that we tend to try to deal with problems on a, a piecemeal basis. You know, uh, it's, it's like um, their caribou are one of the iconic species in Canada and virtually every caribou herd in Canada is now at risk. For one thing, they need a lot of space they're, they're an animal that is constantly on the move. And we're not willing to give them uh, that space. But as caribou populations plummet, what do we do? We say, oh, caribou are disappearing, never looking in the mirror to see the biggest predator. Wolves eat caribou. So if we kill wolves, then we'll manage uh, the caribou and they should bounce. That is the dumbest, the most stupid way of trying to manage an animal uh, like a caribou, but that's the way we do it. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing. Our orca are, are in trouble. 
oh, well, uh, the Southern residents are in, in bad shape. Southern residents, most of the uh, fish they eat are Chinook. So we've got to try to replenish the Chinook population, never asking why the Chinook population's uh, down, never asking, well, what about all the transportation that is deafening them with all of this noise? Uh, what about the area that they need to roam on, on their own, untrammeled by human beings? What about the logging practices? No, no, no. Well, uh, we're going to try to amplify the, the Chinook salmon. We'll do that by stopping the, the, the fishery on that. You know, we don't have a selective commercial fishery that can only target Chinook, but we say those sport fishers, you know, they're the, we'll get them to cut back. This is, again, the stupidest thing. Meanwhile, we're allowing a commercial fishery for herring. Wait a minute now, what do the salmon need? Hmm, I wonder whether the herring have anything to do with it. I mean, it's absolutely absurd. I, uh, we have... Um, uh, a cabin on Quadra Island. And one of our neighbors was a man named Dan LeClaire, who'd lived uh, on Quadra now, I think for 60 years or so. And he used, he's, he's dead now, but he, he used to tell us that when he was a kid, he'd go out in a punt in Hyacinth Bay, where, where our house, our cabin is, and uh, with a rake, he would fill the punt with herring in 15 minutes. They were really abundant. That's the baseline, it seems to me, that's before there was an industrial um, commercial fishery for herring. And that's the way it was all up and down the coast. The uh, DFO finally allowed the commercial fishery to come in. They had one season when the uh, Saners came in and took the herring in, in uh, Hyacinth Bay. They have never come back. We've had our cabin now on Quadra for over 25 years. Only once our little bay by our cabin turned white with milt from spawning herring. And we were so excited. And I thought maybe this is a sign, but they've never come back again. So, you know, this idea, I know DFO's uh, policy is based on this theory or idea that what you have is large interbreeding populations so you can deplete a little over here but they'll be replenished i think we ought to listen to people who've known about the herring and their populations for thousands of years their survival depended on it my uh, my son-in-law is working on his phd now on uh, uh, comparing indigenous management with uh, modern uh, management through dfo and he says that when they go in these digs through uh, communities like, uh, or areas like Quadra, when they dig down into a, a site, one of the most common bones that they find are herring. Herring were a vital part of the, of the diet of indigenous people for, uh, for a long time. And uh, the way, and they tell us, look, the herring are depleted and, um, you know, they're objecting to the, uh, to the industrial uh, take. And of course, if you go to Bella Bella, the, the Hiltzik have been using traditional means where you don't kill the fish, you simply impound them, get them to lay their eggs and uh, release them again. It's, um, I mean, there are artisanal ways of, of uh, getting herring, but of course, what's driving it now is economics. The fleet, the fleet is, uh, means there's a, a massive investment in the boats. And so when you shut down the, uh, the, the, the fishery, of course, you've got all of these assets then that are stranded. It's like the tar sands. You can't shut it down because of the huge uh, investment in the, uh, in the technology. So I, um, I hope as you celebrate herring, we realize that the, the baseline that we use for um, uh, for DFO's policies and uh, quotas that they're setting are way too shallow, that the baseline has to go back uh, maybe a uh, 100 years or more um, to, to get an idea of what we have to aim for uh, in the coming years. The herring have been radically depleted all up and down the coast, and uh, they've got to, uh, we've got to give them a break. We need a, a moratorium, who knows how long, but stop 
the industrial commercial fishery. It's very, very clear. So I'm Cass Gray. I'm on the board of um, CHI. Uh, I want to thank all of our speakers and invite them now to turn on their um, audio and video so we can have our live uh, Q&A. We've got lots of questions lined up here for you all. Um, and perfect. Hi, Eric. Hi. There's Dana. Hi, Dana. Thank you. And we're just waiting for up there. Here comes Bryony and Grant. Okay, shall I just go ahead? Did you want to say something, Grant? No, no. Can't I see. No, again, I just want to thank everybody, uh, David and Bryony and, and Dana and Chief Herrick. Uh, thanks, thanks for your words. And uh, let's let's hear from the people out there and see what questions they got. Thanks a lot. Okay, perfect. Um, we still can't see Bryony. I don't know if she can turn on her video or we'll just have her voice, baby. Are you there, Bryony? Yeah, hi, my camera doesn't work, so. Okay. <laughs> um, so the first uh, question is from Bob Turner and he's directing it to, uh, to you. Um, he says, great historical overview. Question, does DFO acknowledge that there were once many resident populations, but that the commercial fish fisheries wiped them out so that today there is only one migratory population? Or does DFO dispute that there ever were many resident populations? I note that south of the border, American scientists have identified a number of herring populations, yet in Canada, over a much larger part of the Salish Sea, DFO, DFO says we only have one. Um, are, uh, is that addressed? Is that my question? It was addressed to Bryony, but I believe that Dana might have a. Yeah, answer. I mean, I I love Dana. I I mean, I can answer that question too. But I think Dana, um, yeah, Dana, do you want to have a stab at it first? And sure, I will give it a try. I mean, I'm not a fisheries biologist, but I get to hang out with them. And one of the things that folks in the um, herring school were, have done is actually done genetic work um, from fish from Alaska to Washington. And in a paper that was just published this week by Eleni, Eleni Petro, she shows that there actually is genetic differences among the herring on the coast. And it varies with, um, spawning time and with with space. So I this paper is just out and it's gonna be really interesting to see what the what the fallout of that is. Now she's she was doing this on living populations which are already much reduced. So if she's even showing with genetic differences today, I think we can imagine that there is quite a bit of genetic loss in the reduction of the herring. Whether DFO recognizes that or not, I I, I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for DFO and, and uh, it's certainly not being flashed about, <laughs> um, but I, I think that the data are showing and, and oral traditions are showing and people's memories are showing is that there is there's spatially distinct and temporally distinct populations. And I think that's really important too in our, in our to think about the, the, the time, like herring, we think of spawning time being two days, three days, you know, but you saw the quotes that Brian e showed and I showed it. The spawning time was long. And we have um, interviews from a fisher from Washington who just passed at 90 something. And he regularly was fishing for herring in, um, and spawning time in December. So I think we just don't have any idea about the length of spawning, the spatial extent, the genetic diversity. Um, and whether DFO acknowledges that or not, I, I don't know, but I think that's what the data show. Okay, uh, we also have a question, uh, a question for Eric. Um, 
the question is, uh, DFO didn't reply to the December 2019 letter from Wasanek, First, uh, First Nation, requesting a moratorium on the hearing. What legal means do we have to force DFO to comply with the Douglas treaties? Well, <clears throat> of course, there's always the, uh, the legal means of, uh, of suing them for mismanagement mismanagement of, of the fishery that uh but that that takes money it's like uh grant was saying every everything that we do takes money and uh, that would be a very very expensive court case against dfo um but uh speaking speaking on, on the, the way dfo makes their decisions uh say out first nation took uh uh, the government of Canada and the province and uh, Sanish Bay Marina to court in uh, 1985. <clears throat> 1985 and the case, case lasted about eight years and uh, actually showed that uh, that uh, DFO, the minister, does not abide by the own the science of his own scientist within DFO that uh, he takes uh, information and he makes a political decision. And that was shown in the Santa Bay Marina case where all the echelons of uh, DFO scientists and uh, managers recommended against uh, building Santa Bay Marina in Santa Bay in front of the village of Sale. They all recommended against all the way down the line, but the minister okayed it. The minister okayed it, so it was a political decision. So that that shows how decisions are made within DFO. It's not made from the people that work there. It's made from the people that that run DFO, the, the ministers and and their their people that they they choose to work with. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, that that is the the sad uh, sad reality that that we have to live with. And uh, the the chiefs of the Spanish nation who asked for the the immediate moratorium on on uh, the herring fishery, the commercial herring fishery in the Salish Sea, we all we've gotten is, is a is a meeting with one of the local local uh, DFO uh, managers for for the coast of BC, but not the minister himself, not the assistant minister. Nobody from, from the main office, only somebody from the local office. And um, so the, the chiefs of the Spanish nation are still banging on the door, wanting, wanting meetings, but uh, so far we haven't been successful. Thanks, so, Eric. Uh, Kath, can I just comment? Um, yeah. When the latest government got in and, and the, the, the Liberals got back in again, uh, and they appointed Bernadette Jordan as the um, fisheries minister, we were actually fairly optimistic there for a while because she's from a variety in Nova Scotia. So we were hoping she would have been aware of the, of the cod collapse and, uh, and uh, working with all the First Nations there, which have, have, they've been more successful in some of these issues than we managed to be out here. I think partly be, it's like David Suzuki said, Ottawa is a long way from British Columbia. It's a long way, Eric, for you to get all the way out there just to go to talk to a minister. But so we were a bit optimistic, but I'm sadly sad to say that it hasn't turned out that way. So yeah, we'll keep working at it. So on the topic of what, what can we do, one of the questions is what, what can we do as ordinary citizens? We need to take some kind of action, letters, phone calls, protests, et cetera. Uh, please advise. Yeah, Any maybe I can just say, I, I think the number one thing we all have to do is support Eric, the Wasanic people, the council, all the First Nations in the territories where all the people live that are, that are now listening to this. If they can connect with with those people and support them. And like Eric says, it's gonna take lawsuits. It's gonna take 
it, it's going to take education of the settler community that that uh, uh, Bryony was talking about and that amazing book from uh, David Elliott that Eric mentioned. The, these are the things I think are going to build something that's going to move towards eventually closing this thing down, hopefully. Eric, I don't know if you agree with that, but. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, really, it, it, we need uh, we need the broad support of the public in order to really grab this by the horn. I think that, uh, and that's gonna take a lot of publicity, a lot of education, and uh, a lot of people like David Suzuki, you know, coming forward and uh, Gord John, to bring these issues forward and push them push them forward, especially all the way to Ottawa and, and uh, really twist arms, I think, because if we don't, then uh, sadly, it, it's, it's close to the end and we, we really have to sound the alarms. So there's a question to Bryony. Do you think Jim Patterson should be confronted on this issue and does he have the power to stop this? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think, I think when you look at the extent of his involvement in the in the industry, there's no question that he has influence. If you look at the makeup of the the varying advisory committees for the herring advisory boards and things, they're they're composed of industry people and largely his employees. Um, he's got even what I'd call strange inexplicable hooks into this industry by setting up almost impossible issues uh, to address like creating his charitable donations to sick children's hospitals through the donation of herring. I mean, these are all things that make it almost impossible to um, you know, bring it up in public and and try and point to the to the obvious links with industry and and how um, someone who's got so much power in British Columbia. It's not just that he owns the fishing companies, but he owns he's got a ma majority share in most of the logging companies in in many of the um, you know the coal port, the Save on Foods that is selling farm salmon. I mean, we haven't even talked about the role of farm salmon in and um, the, you know, the occurrence of sea lice and herring, because herring swims straight through the nets of these fish farms. And then, um, you know, as Alex Morton, you'll hear tomorrow, um, the lice just adhere to these, these young herring and they've had it. So, I mean, these are all things that Patterson indirectly has a, has a relationship with and he could do a lot and I he seems to be untouchable on this one and um and he's an untouchable person in government so I feel that the um the Heltzik and the and the Haida they've they've all just I was you know I remember covering the stories of the Heltzik where all the Himas just got in their boats and blocked the Saners. And that was the what it took to stop Patterson and his boats. But um, I think the other thing is that Patterson has been very, very effective at, um, I believe, dividing and conquering um, communities, one from the other, um, because of the way he's, he's distributed his, um, uh, management and ownership operations through communities. And, and so this is another really very difficult issue to, to tackle. And it makes it very difficult for um, the different communities to address because, you know, there might be a, a member of that community that has a partial share and a senior and they, they, you know, it's almost impossible for them to get out. So um, I think Patterson has a lot to do with it. He should be showing some leadership. I, I think it's I think it's completely immoral that someone can make ten point nine billion dollars in in the year of COVID, and 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 can't even take the time to listen to 
um, you know, our leaders like Chief Palki about what impact it has on his community. Question for Eric, for Chief Palki. Um, could you please offer a very short lesson on how to say and pronounce let the herring live in Wasanic? Well, um, our language of the Spanish nation is called Sanchothan. Sanchothan is our language. And it really, it, the, the literal interpretation of uh, Sanchothan is, is my mouth. That's what it means, my mouth. And, and it's our belief that um, everything in your that, that your life actually comes out of your mouth. And that's why it's so powerful. Your words can be powerful and they can, they can build people up, but they can also destroy them what comes out of your mouth. And that's what there, our belief is that the, what's coming out of you is actually your life that, that can bless things or it can tear things down. So it's very powerful and you have to be careful with it. So uh, just to explain what that means, but Halit, Halit, Halit the Slanet. Halit the Slanet, that's how you pronounce it. And uh, Halit is, is, uh, is uh, St. Charleston spelling. And uh, um, that the I that's in that sounds like an E, halit. And the E that's in that word is a, sounds like a U, halit. And slanet, uh, we have uh, a Sanchasan pronunciation, slanet is, is spelled with an S and an in in uh, L with a T cross, which means that. that it's like a THL, THL pronunciation, slanet, slanet, that's, that's, that's how you pronounce it. So that's a short lesson on, on that pronunciation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, someone is asking, um, research on salmon done on isotopes found in trees allows you to look at relative strength of runs over time by sampling tree rings. Can similar studies be done for herring? I imagine that's a question for Dana. So um, let me just make sure, could, uh, research on salmon done on isotopes found in trees. Uh, so I think we have really good data already on the strength of the runs from the archaeological record. And um, I'm not actually sure what the isotope data would show in this case, um, but the bones, I think, tell the story that needs to be told, which is that there, <laughs> there was a lot of herring and they were everywhere all the time. I think that that's pretty pretty clear. I we just finished an excavation here in Laskiti and um, sure enough, the main, the main fish is herring and there's not a herring to be seen anywhere around here. So I just want to um, make sure that people understand where this, why this fish is being harvested. It's being harvested industrially for the roe for the, that gets sent as a delicacy to, to Japan, the Kazunoko. And what's really interesting about that is that, in fact, culturally, the younger generation in Japan aren't that interested in Kazunoko. They're losing the taste for it. But a few years ago, Harper went to Japan to try to increase the industry to get people interested in that flavor again and get them interested in harvesting Kazunoko because we wanted to send the row from the biggest females the most productive females, the best row uh, overseas. So just compare that to like, you know, we're sending a delicacy over to, to Japan that has kind of outlived its, its cultural importance at the expense of our own seas here, does not compute. Okay, um, 
Another question from Bob Turner uh, to Bryony. I live in Howe Sound. We have a local spawning population here that kicked back in about 2000 after being absent for 30 years. Is it possible that our Howe Sound herring may be fished in the food and bait fishery in the Gulf Islands? Hi, Bob. Thanks for that question. Um, yes, I believe so. Um, it, I think one of the biggest questions that we need to put to DFO um, is why they're not practicing their own policy, which is a precautionary principle. And, and two, that they're, you know, in, if you look at actually their integrated management plans, they, they use a lot of language around, um, you know, the need to uh, respect scientific data and, and indigenous values and ecosystem values. You know, at first reading, you think, great, there's absolutely no reason why they would be um, continuing with the food and bait fishery especially so just for people to understand the food and bait fishery goes on in the in the winter um, prior to the the row fishery in the in the spring but the thing about the food and bait fishery is it really does target what we you know we've all been talking about is these resident populations and we really don't in terms of western science we really don't understand um, what impact these commercial fisheries have had on those, those old, very reliable fisheries that inhabited every single, when you saw those little dots, both in Dana's presentation and in mine, we don't really understand what impact that the commercial fishery had. My suspicion and many people's suspicion is that the food and bait fishery has actually been more devastating than the roe fishery. Um, because every time these, these, these residents kind of start to climb out of their uh you know out of being pushed back so heavily that then they the food and bait just prowl around and just come and scoop them up again and so diminishing that little um genetic stock if as as um tony pitcher's another one of the authors that dana was talking about i, I spoke to tony just recently right after the um publishing of his of his um article in in the royal society um, that came out this week. And he said, you know, he said definitively the genetics show that herring go home. Um, and this is, this is really, it and therefore begs all these questions about the relationship between the migratory populations and the, and the resident populations and whether there's, and I think these are very dynamic, complex, cultural and, and, and genetic patterns that we as Western scientists don't fully understand. So that's a long answer to your question, which I think the food and bait fishery is devastating and it should never have been allowed. Okay, there's a question. Are there herring roe fisheries in the USA that are still open or is the Strait of Georgia the last one on the entire coast? anyone know that? Well, I, I do know that. I just in that I've been corresponding with some of the both the scientists and the and the community activists. And there was a, a great paper that was put out by the American fishery scientists that listed all the impacts um, that herring are vulnerable to. And at the top of the list, they said the biggest one and the easiest one to remedy is the fisheries in across the border. <laughs> because there are no, they're commercial, they've, they've put a moratorium on all their fisheries. Um, and they, they've been trying to tease out some of these complex genetic questions and things like that and worked on this paper. But they, they do recognize that whatever has been happening with this population, that the one thing that they could control for because it's so easy is, is, is the commercial fishery. And I think that we owe, 
we owe this not only to everybody in Canada, but our neighbors across the way that we've, we have an obligation. We share the Salish Sea and we shouldn't be tampering um, because they've requested that we not. Okay, um, another question. Were more people, especially Indigenous communities, fed by herring prior to the commercial fishery openings than are fed today with 12% of the catch going to Japanese? Uh, uh, that disappeared. <laughs> oh, that was my, um, so I can answer that. Um, the answer is yes. Many, 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 many people were fed by herring consistently through time for thousands of years. And I think one thing that people maybe don't know is how many people lived on the coast here before European diseases and settlers moved in. There were indigenous people everywhere on the coast. It was packed with people. Uh, anthropologists think it's one of the most densely settled places in, in North America. And we know from the record that those people were in most, many parts of the coast living on herring. If you look at the early Captain Cook drawings for the Nochalness, the longhouse is just filled with herring, like it's stunning. So yes, the answer is yes, many more people were fed in the past than today on herring. Okay. By the way, um, Eric sent a message in the chat. He said, I'm sorry, I have to go now. I have just arrived home for this event and have not had my supper yet. Thank you all for this event. So that's where, where Eric's gone. That was very kind of him to stay up so late uh, without his supper for us. Um, okay. Uh, I'm trying to, I've got a few um, responses here, um, but I'm actually looking for questions. And um, yeah, if anyone thinks their question hasn't been answered, um, otherwise I think we've gone about 30 minutes at this point and we can, uh, we can wrap up and thank all the panelists and um, over to Grant now. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dana, Bryony, uh, Chief Pelkey. That it was really interesting. The whole thing, your presentations, and then the answers were very illuminating. Um, it just shows the complexity of all of this, from a cultural and the scientific and management and legal, and it, it's it really is complicated. And it's uh, your education and your speeches or your speaking, the way you present it, is just incredible. Thank you. So uh, we just want to. Um, uh, thank all the people that tuned in tonight. Uh, uh, we want to put let people know that the art show is still going on. If you go to hornbyarts.com, you can see all the art, different types of artwork put together by different people on Hornby Island and, are, and around this, around British Columbia. It's there. They're there till March the 31st. It's very interesting. It's uh, nicely presented. Uh, you can go to Facebook anytime now. The, the Casey and Finnegan uh, boat trip pictures are there now uh, on, on Facebook all the time. Um, and as I said earlier, we're going to be updating the virtual boat trip continuously over the next week or two as the herring fishery kicks in, maybe on Sunday or Monday when the boats are out there. And already uh, just going around the island today, just seeing how many uh, the interested people out there now looking out would tell us huge binocular looking at what's going on out there. There's huge masses of birds and we, there's whales out here and everything else. That, we're gonna be videoing all that continuously over the next while. We'll be sending that out to you. We'll give you the links to that. So we hopefully you can tune into that. So if you can stay on now for a while longer, we've got three videos. You could you can watch Harriet the Herring is number one. And then number two is the Herring Fishery by Bob Turner. And number three is the Casey and Finnegan uh, boat first boat ride it's called so tomorrow night we have we have another uh, uh, it's or tomorrow I'm sorry tomorrow starting at 10 there's a, there's another we have another group of speakers uh, and I think it's going to be very interesting so if you're interested in tomorrow possibly uh, again with a question and answer at the end of it and uh, 
Dana and, and Brian and hopefully Eric will be on there tomorrow for a broader wrap up panel session. So uh, it, unless um, anybody else has got anything to wrap up, I'm gonna say thank you all very much for attending uh, the first uh, um, Herring School event of Herring Fest 2021. Thank you very much. <laughs>